Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. <clears throat> so we want to say happy Sabbath to each and every one of us here and for those who are joining us online. This is the first lesson, the second quarter of 2024. And we're looking at the great controversy. And this week we will have we were looking, <clears throat> excuse me. Waiting on the Lord. No, wait, hold on. Yep. No, the war, the war behind all wars. Let us pray. Eternal Father, we give you thanks for this morning another day that you have afforded us to come into your court to worship you. Father, we invite your Holy Spirit present in our life and in this place today. We ask that you will remove everything that is not of you, any distraction, and anything, Lord, that will rise itself against you. Father, we thank you, Father, for bringing the ones that are here already. I pray that you will hasten the steps of those that are coming, and for those that are unable to make it with us today, I pray, Father, that you'll be with them and bless them. Hear our prayers, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Sabbath, the war behind all wars. Our memory text is taken from Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 8. It says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So what we notice here, we have Michael and his angels, but we also have the dragon and what? And his angels. And so where did the war begin? In heaven. So a perfect place heaven. Yet still that's the first mention of where war began. So if war can start in heaven where we have a perfect place and a perfect God and holy being, <clears throat> what's stopping it from happening here? What can stop it from happening here on earth? Anybody? Nothing. And that is why we're in this great controversy because the war that started in heaven came down where? It came down to earth. The, the question is asked, if God is so good, why is the world so bad? Anybody want to give that a shot? If God is so good, why is the world so bad? Because you have good and evil here. And um, the devil is here in man's heart as well. <clears throat> so um, everybody has free choices. So it depends on what you choose. We're going to have both good and evil. We're going to have wickedness because people choose to do wicked. People choose to do wickedness. Anybody, Miss Sylvia, you have something you want to say? I see you looking, puzzling. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? because we have free choices. And so how then the next question is, how can a God of love allow so much evil <clears throat> to exist? If he's a God of love, why does he allow evil to exist? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Free, free choice. Free choice. And so, go, Evin. I was saying, God, God always don't just wipe us out like that. He give us chances to, to repent as well. And so we see his love coming out even through, you know, his mercies coming out even by not wiping, out, wiping us out as we sin, because the ways of sin is dead. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't have to prolong even with Satan, but he prolong it just because of his love and also for others to see, you know, what the result of 
disobedient does. I like what you said. He didn't even have to prolong with Satan. And not just Satan, because <clears throat> when Adam and Eve sinned, he could have forget about them and start afresh again. But that is what his love does. He forgives and he moves on in helping us to walk the walk that we should. When the earth was destroyed, he could have destroyed everybody. Eight people was saved. Even when the children of Israel in the wilderness and in their disobedient, he said, you remember, I don't know if you remember one time he said to Moses, let me just get rid of all of them and start a new people for you. But because we have free choices, because as the lesson said, love can never be forced or coerced, because if that's the case, then it is not what? It's not free and it's not love, because it's, then it becomes by force. Because if you force me to love you, I will just say I love you because it is forced upon me, but not because I really love you. And that is why, <clears throat> and that is why we have, no, I have water, I have water. <clears throat> and that is why we have free choices today. And we still see that as much as God is good, we still see the reason why evil is here. Because sin has a price. And sin must run its course. And so sin is running its course, and God is allowing men and women the opportunity to repent, the opportunity to come to him. So we know we always get the question, why do bad things happen to good people? The fact that we quote and quote think we are good, it doesn't mean that we, can, we are excluded from Satan's trap. Look at Job. Was Job doing anything? But Job felt the suffering because of the attack of the enemy. And again, if war could start in the presence of God, and a third of the angels could subject themselves to Satan, evil plot. Do you think earth is going to escape? When the scripture says, woe to what? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because why? The devil has come down having what? Come on, people. Having what? Great wrath. So he didn't come down and said, okay, I am kicked out of heaven, so I'm just going to behave myself. No, the scripture said he came down having great wrath. So the same thing that he did in heaven, he's going to try to do it on earth. Huh? No, um, you just said he could have changed his ways once he comes down. No, that's not what I said. I said, if he did that in heaven, why would we think that he would come on earth and just sit down? When, this, when the Bible tells us he came down with great wrath. So it says, God is a God of incredible love. His very nature is love, and all his actions are loving. Love can never be forced or coerced or legislated. Ellen G. White states it well when she writes, only by love is love awakened. To deny the power of choice is to destroy the ability to love, and to destroy the ability to love is to eradicate the possibility of being truly happy. God's win, God wins our allegiance by his love. He is dealing with the great controversy between good and evil in such a way that sin will never rise again in this universe. 
So it says God's purpose is to demonstrate before the entire universe that he has always acted in the best interest of his creature. Looking at the world through the lens of God's love, in the light of the great controversy between good and evil, reassures each of us that right will triumph over wrong and will do so forever. So even though it might seem that Satan is winning now, we have read the book and we know how it ends, right? So because of that, we have great hope. Because even though he, the enemy is running to and fro on the earth, he is still subject to God's. He cannot do what God doesn't allow him to do. He's still subject to God. And we know that one day, all his tricks and everything will come to an end. We're going to go to Sunday. War in heaven. Can somebody read Revelation chapter 12, 7 to 9? I have it. I have it. Now, war or wars in heaven. Michael and his angel fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angel fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for, uh, for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angel was thrown down with him. Thank you. And so we, we, we sort of touch on that in Sabbath, that the war in heaven in such a perfect place. And, but we want to know that he did not win the war in heaven, and neither is he going to win the one here. So he was thrown out, and that's what brought on this great cosmic conflict that we see today. And the reason why there's war on earth, you know, there are people on the side of the enemy, and there are people on the side of God. And the enemy is still trying to win people over to him, just as he did in heaven and win a third of the angels. So he's still whispering sweet nothing, if you will, in their ear. Because the scripture tells us that hell was made for who? For the devil and his angel. But what is happening? Man is fighting him for a foothold down there. Because you have some people that are living and some who have lived on the face of the earth. That does nothing more than work for who? For the enemy. Just like how he has his angels. And so as long as this world exists, there is going to be the push between good and evil. Even you have something to say? Now I was just thinking that just as you said earlier, he came down with great wrath. And I know he's in the hearts of man more than ever now because he knows that the, the hell was made for him and his angel. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure he doesn't want to go there just for him and his angel alone. So as much as he can get on his side, he is working overtime, you know, to get those on his side. And we, as you said before, we know what the end result is going to be. And it's just that man's heart is so hard so hardened, they, even from childhood, we grow up hearing what the end is going to be. Nobody has any excuse. Mm -hmm. The message is far going, and still yet people hear the news, and they still harden their hearts. They still choose, you know, on the side of the enemy. You know, you have some people who says from their born until now, they hear that Jesus is coming and nothing is happening, so they choose to live how they want to live. But it doesn't mean that because it, it hasn't happened as yet, that it is not going to happen. And if we should look at history and look at the Bible, we can see that the things that are written in the Bible, some have come to pass and some we are living in the time of some right now. And so it's not only that he doesn't want to go 
to hell with only him and his angel. He knew what he missed out in heaven. He knew what he missed out in heaven, and he knew that we are going to enjoy what he once had. So let us look at Ezekiel 28, somebody, Ezekiel 28, 15, sorry, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15, and Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. So two people, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15, and Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. And let us see what went on in the mind of Lucifer and what led him to rebellion. So Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15 says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyros, and say unto him, Thus said the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the tarpas, and the, di the diamond, the beryl, the oxen, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the Sorry. The emerald and the carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that cover it, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy, in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. Until iniquity. So, so somebody else. We're gonna dissect that. Somebody else read, and then we go. Um, Isaiah fourteen twelve to fourteen, please. Isaiah. Chapter 14, 12 to 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down from the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Thank you. So the question says now, what went on in the mind of this angelic being? So we're gonna look at him being an angelic being and him now becoming a demon, why? So when we look at Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12 to 15, even though the scripture says, son of man, rise a lamentation over the king of Tari. We know that the king of Tari one was not in the garden of Eden. So it's symbolic with say, because well, Satan was in the garden of Eden. That's how we deceive Eve. And when you talk about every precious stone where you're covering, if you should do a study on the stones that cover Satan and the stone that were on the high priest's garment, you would have recognized that there's only one stone that is on the high priest that was not on Satan's covering. And so that is why when he's running rogue sometimes, it's hard to distinguish because his covering was so much so lightened to the covering of the high priest. And so it says, Every precious stone, and it named the stone, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, all of that. And it says, you were the, an you were the anointed guardian trobe, and I placed you on the holy mountain, and you walk amidst the stone of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until. So God didn't create the devil. He created Lucifer. Lucifer created the devil. So everything in Lucifer was good. He led the angelic choir. You see, you know why music sometimes affect us the way it does? Because Satan knows every instrument, every note and what to play. 
And so he knows what to use to get people to his side. And then we turn now to Isaiah and it says, how you are fallen, son of the morning. And it tells us that he was cut down. He was brought low. Why, verse 13? Because he said in his heart, I will ascend above the heaven. So whose place he want to take now? He want to take the place of God above the star. And I will set my throne on high. You hear the eyes? And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far north. And I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will make myself. I will make myself like. So he was not comfortable being Lucifer. He was not comfortable with his role of being the, 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 the covering cherub or the, and the one that led. The, there was something else that he wanted and that is this, that's why the scripture said he was perfect until iniquity was found in him and so this this is not saying that we must not want good but we have to be careful at what extent we want to go to get what we want because he was not comfortable just being who he, are. he thought he can be above the person who created him. And so he schemed and he plotted and some of the angels fell for it and they to receive their demise. So it says God did not create the devil. He created a being of dazzling brightness named Lucifer. We all know that Lucifer created the being desired to desire the worship that belonged only to who? Only to God. And so he attempted to usurp God's throne by questioning God's authority. And his rebellion led to open warfare in heaven. You see, if God wasn't a God of love... And if God was a God of dictator, the very mo you see, God read the thoughts and the heart. You think he didn't know what Satan was thinking or what Lucifer was thinking? But because he gave free will, free choices, he allowed him to think. And Because if God was a dictator, God, he would have shut him down from the very moment. You see that? He would have shut him down. Go ahead. I want to ask a question. What is wrong in wanting to be like God? Or should we, stri should we strive to be... Hans like is answering. Hold on, hold on. Take the floor, Hans. Take the floor. Can I finish asking a question? <laughs> James says no. <laughs> All right, let you finish, Hans, and then we get to you. Yes, should we try, strive to be like God, be like God? We must strive to be like God in walking for him and living for him, but not to be God. Where did he say he wanted to put his throne? Isn't it above God? Yeah. So he, he's, he wasn't striving to be like God in wanting obedience to God. He wanted to take the place of God, even go higher than God. Go, hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. So he's answering. Depending. <laughs> Yes, but he wanted to be like God. Yes. Story. Above. So if I want to be like you, I will emulate you and do it. But when I want to go above you, I no longer want to be you, you know. 
I want to take it a step further. So now instead of looking up to you, you now have to look up to me. And that is what Satan, so he no longer want, he, he didn't want to circle to look up to God. He want to put himself in that position that the, 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 the Godhead look up to him. He wants to place himself above God. Huh? Yeah. The creature want to be ahead of the creator. And that is what happened. So that is what caused that. That is what caused that open rebellion because now he started to make God seems like a dictatorship God and seems like, you know, why do I have to listen to, or why do we have to subject to him, so to say? Why is it that we can't go above him and above what he says? <clears throat> Right, that's why. Why, why do I have, why you have to have this sovereignty over us? Why we can't be on the same level or even above you? And so the gossiping started. And then those that he was able to deceive, they buy into it. Yeah, well, and that's thinking he's equal, but he's not. Because there's nobody on the face of the earth that can take the place of our God. Everybody else is created. But God was not created by any human hand. And that is what they seem to forget. He is sovereign. The very breath that they breathe belongs to who? So how can you be above the person whose breath you're breathing? So as James said, if you think about the Pope, I think about those people. God is alive. They're dead. As one pope did, another one did, and replaced. You never, when John Paul was lying there in the cassock, and who, the one before, Benedict or whatever, did you ever see them get up? Let them try it. Sometimes I, I'm crazy. Sometimes I wonder if there was drugs in heaven. If there was what? Drugs. Well. If, if Satan was on something, <laughs> why? Because I don't think he was really thinking straight. How can you, this person created you. If the person snap your finger or even speak, you can be destroyed. If the person go like this. And you can, and, and you trying to fight with this, this, this um, trying to fight with your creator. But again, the cosmic conflict, and when you read the book of Revelation, and the scripture tell you, even though he has been cast out and he knows what his end is, the scripture tell you that before the new Jerusalem come down, we're going to have one great what? And who is going to lead that battalion? He's still trying. But I see also when Jesus, you know, Jesus was supposed to come to die for us, how he tried to destroy him. Even when he was in the wilderness with him, I was he gonna to tempt him. I mean, what what was one of the temptations? He said to, to Jesus, "All oh, this is mine. So if you bow down, he so so if it belongs to me, I shouldn't be forcing you to bow. You should have known that you need to bow because I have control. So he took the owner of the world." and show him the view of the world and tell him that it belongs to him. Go ahead, DJ. Oh, you know, the, I know mm -hmm. we, we go over this type of um, lesson over and over and for generations, and I know it's, con it's gonna continue until the end of time. But um, I always said I have so many questions to ask God, uh, or actually Jesus. But one question, if I had one, only one question to ask. You said it in the beginning, heaven was perfect. So where does that, uh, I can see us as um, earth, when Lucifer came down, 
so now um, he tempted Eve so cause, because he was on earth, so sin become. But heaven was perfect. Where would that? The iniquity that was found in him? Yeah, found in him. How could he? No, but the free choice, I, mm -hmm. I get the free choice. But the free choice had to be, you know, um, bacteria uh, form or uh, any little thing you put on earth because there's, there's bad things that can enter. But where would that begin? That's a question I think, uh, I'm not questioning God, but if I have one question I want him to save when I get in there for him to tell me, it's that question. All right, you know how the scripture tells us that we have desires, right? And he said in the scripture that he will give us the desires of our heart, but what? That desire have to be in line with what? His will. It's the same thing. Satan had a desire. And that desire was to take what belonged to God. Again, when God created... But that's what it says, until iniquity was found in you. So when he created Satan, he didn't create him that he couldn't think and want and, and even covet, let us say. But he gave each and every one of us the opportunity, I guess, between right and wrong. And so when Satan saw how the Godhead was formed and how everything, he wanted that. It's just the, it's just the want that he gravitated to. So, so I think my question is, well, <coughs> did God create sin? Because Satan didn't know sin. Um, um, they had to have that thing. So where would he feel that for him to have that temptation? There had to be something in the atmosphere for something to be perfect. Mm -hmm. If you keep it in a bubble, it's gonna stay there because it's in a bubble. But you keep heaven, you keep yeah. it in a bubble. Yeah, heaven. That's what I'm saying. That's not free. That's not free. You keep it in a bubble. It is locked. Yeah, heaven should be a bubble. No. That's but if funny. heaven be a bubble, then Satan would have been right with what he told the angel about God. God give us, but God give us the same, the same intellect that we have. I know the devil might even have probably have more. more intellect. Intellect to think, intellect to, 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 to do good. He decided, he give us free choices. And love has to come with freedom. It has to come with freedom. Whatever we choose, even in, in heaven, why did a set of the angels choose to stay on the pure side and another set choose to stay? It didn't happen overnight. He gradually, he gradually, he gradually started. There was pure. There was just pure in heaven. No, but all of them were pure. All of them were pure. But the choices, that shows you that free choices started in heaven. Free choices started in heaven. You decide, they decide, they are created beings. God give them that intellect still to choose. And then if they and were in a bubble, as we would have said, then they would have been robotic angel. Only when Jesus pressed the button, I'm coming to your hands, only when, quote unquote, Jesus would have pressed the button, so to say, yes, master, no, Lord, whatever. There would be no choice to make their very move or have their very own desires. Go, Hans. I can tell you she's thinking. Her eyes went up. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess um, when we get to heaven, I guess you know, because she's the only one who understands what I'm saying. No, I understand what you're saying, you know, is that how can, how can iniquity find itself in such a perfect place? There had to be a whole 
No. So, that means God is not you, perfect then. Because, you know, like, the, uh, if you have, um, if you have a fire somewhere and there's no oxygen, if you don't open for a split of the oxygen to come to bring the fire from outside to inside, it will never burst. But because of no, but, if but you the, the content, it, it seems like heaven was controlled and there's no way for sin to be into um, sin. It's like there's something we miss there. But you see, you see, our, we are looking at it. In our, our, little, it, imagine, our limited imagination, limited that's what I will tell it. That we yeah, have. we are looking at it. We are looking at the supreme God with our little intellect. Think bigger than that. This is a perfect God we are talking about. A perfect, perfect And this is God, what the lesson says. Example. The lesson says he attempted to usurp God. So you know what I mean, like put himself in God. Usurp God throne by questioning God's authority. Yeah, but it's because you, he had a mind. You can't question authority if you don't have the mind to question, you know. You follow what I'm saying? If you don't have that mind to question, you just sit down willy-nilly. Can't question anything. But because God gave us that mind, and as Yvonne said, that intellect, that's the reason we can question or we choose to question. Look, if you have a supervisor or your boss, and sometimes they probably talk to you, you probably would say, who give them that authority over me? It's the same thing Satan was saying. Who, who give him... Be, be, no, because we are given the ability to think and ask questions. One, one other point. God made us sociable beings. Sociable beings. We were made to socialize, talk with God, commune with him. Even when he made Adam and Eve, he went down in the cool of the day and he communicated with them. It's the same thing in heaven. He made his, his angels sociable beings. And so that we are able to think, we are able to talk with each other. We are able, so, so, so just like how we're talking to each other, they're talking to each other. They're sociable beings, so we are able to think. And so the free choice to choose whatever is there as well. It's that God would not be a God of love. All right, so we will let us move to Monday. We have um, 21 minutes. Oh, you have a question there, I'm sorry. Just, just real quickly, I, I always look at it like this. So God can't lie. He has to be honest. That's his character. Mm -hmm. So giving us free will but having us in a bubble so that we could never, ever have a thought that mm -hmm. we, we might want to go against him, mm -hmm. that would be a lie. Yeah, yes, he, yes. He knows everything. So how is he being a God of justice, a God of truth, going to be able to and a God of love. false love? So it, he would be the only one that would know that and it was And that a lie. is what Satan accused him of. He would be the only one that would know that it was a lie, but mm -hmm. he, he, he can't do that. So that's it. Yeah. So let us run to Monday. It says, Lucifer deceives Christ. Lucifer deceives, Christ prevails. And we know his deception. Um, if in touch on it, we're going to talk about how he tried to deceive Christ, or he tempt him then. And we talk about that. You are tempting the person that has the world in his palm of his hand, so to say, by offering him what he already owns. So it's like somebody come to your house and said, you have a car and the person said, I'm going to give you that car out there. If you bow to me, the car already belong to you. I don't need to bow. But you see, the same mindset that Satan have in heaven, that he need to ascend above the throne of God so, so to get worship, is the same mindset he come down to earth with, you know, don't think it changed. And that is why he was able to show himself to Christ. Offer, what was he offering Christ? Everything that he offered was already God's. And then when it couldn't get any worse, he started to twist the scripture. But because Christ's word is alive and active, Christ said what? To him. It is written. And how can you tell somebody it is written if you don't know what is written? 
So much so, what did he say? Didn't he say he will give his angels charge over you? He, knew, he knows the scripture, but God used that very same scripture to rebuke him. And so it says there is no logical explanation for why Lucifer, this perfect angel, should have allowed pride and jealousy to take root in, the, in his heart and to grow into rebellion against the creator. Satan pride ripened into open rebellion. He accused God of being unjust and unfair. He infected the angels with his doubt and accusation. So is, you know, even probably know that song that they taught us in school when we were growing up. Seven little habits in the heart of ours. Or I don't remember if it says seven or it says some little habits in the heart of ours. But it goes on to say envy, jealousy, malice, pride. They shouldn't be in the heart of ours. That was what was found in the heart of Lucifer. He envied God for his throne. There was jealousy. And so he started to gossip with the angel. Pride. There's a little bit of pride in every one of us, you know, believe it or not. But what happened to his pride? It said it was right. He couldn't control it and he couldn't hide it under a rock. It had to, mani it had to manifest itself. And that's what it did that caused the rebellion. And so it says that in Revelation 12, verse 4, he said, His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. And that, that to go in detail, is for um, another time. But we know that in his open rebellion, misery love what? Misery love company. So Satan didn't just have his thought and keep it to himself and say let me try he tried to get others under his banner so it says when the war broke in heaven and the angels had to decide would they follow Jesus or Lucifer what was the nature of the war was it a physical or the war of idea or both what was it pastor what was it was it a physical war a war of idea or both Y'all, your name, Pastor? So, 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 so it's about. So, and it says we don't know the detail, but the conflict was physical enough that Satan and his agent eventually was cast out. Because if a war is not physical. I wouldn't even consider it a war. Right. And it says, and place was not found for them in heaven any longer. Because just imagine if God had kept him any longer in heaven. There would be no heaven. And, and he wouldn't only took a third with him. He probably would have taken the entire angelic beings with him. So it said, one thing is certain about the war in heaven is every angel had to decide for or against Christ. Whom would they follow? You have a point of view? Yes, I want to, to say, um, if we notice, he think about it in his heart first. So as they said, as a man think it. So is so he. We have to be careful. So the thought start in his heart. He start to think about before anybody else knows about it. He start to think about it first in his heart, cherish those thoughts as well, and then start to act on it. So it tells us then that we have to be careful of what we think about, God guard the avenue of our heart, mm -hmm. and allow God, because it, sometimes it happened to me, some stuff just run across my mind, and if I don't dismiss it, I start to act on it or cherish it. And the desires. It, and so it's, it's so important that we be careful of what our mm -hmm. mind is full of. Yes, and it, it says the angels had to make a choice. Whether they were going for God or they were going for Lucifer. We too, we too have to make a choice. Because don't bother think that because it started up there, we are not part of this great cosmic conflict. Because the, where were they cast? Down here, with great wrath. So we are part of it and we have 
to make a choice whether we want to live for Christ or we want to live for the enemy. And at the end of it all, your choice determines your destination, where you spend eternity, heaven or hell. So again, we too have a choice because the same way he went about in heaven, the scripture tells us he moved about like a warring lion, doing what? Seeking whom he may devour. So he's, he still has an agenda. He wasn't finished in heaven, but it was only that he was cast out of heaven. All right, we're, we're moving on to Tuesday. Well, it's as if I went into Tuesday already. Planet Earth becomes involved. So we can just say Wednesday, love finds a way. So with all the war and all the chaos, love still finds a way. Who want to tell me how? Genesis 3.15. I love, I don't know who don't love, but I love, love Genesis 3.15 because that gives me hope. He did tell them that he's going to put enmity between the woman and, and between your offspring and, and the, the devil, and he shall bruise his head, but you shall bruise his heel. So when, as DJ said, when Adam and Eve sin, love steps in. Christ now know that he had to do something. And the scripture tells us that Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world because, because God sees everything. He knew what was going to take place. So he had already made provision. He had already made provision to save humanity. You remember in Gethsemane? When the weight of the world laid heavily on Christ, because he was carrying your sins and my sin, and he didn't commit a sin. Can you imagine that? And when it lay heavily on him, so much so he said, if it is possible, let it pop, but nevertheless, not my will, because he know that this is the only way to help humanity. He took the lashing for us. He took Everything he was put upon for us. The, the scriptures say he took what we deserve so that we can live the life he deserves. So that is love, and that is what Satan it refused to see that God is always and will always be a God of love. Go, DJ. You know, two, um, two part of, um, I have two questions. Um, I know um, God used to talk with Adam and Eve, um, you know, have their little walk. But you know, once, once they sin, and then now he come and um, kill that um, lamb. lamb for them. I wonder if he had talked, I know we have different books, but if he had talked with them or Adam and Eve knew what was for coming for them, what just happened, what he did at that moment was something that coming for them in the future. <sighs> that, that um, you know, and then did Satan at that moment, I know he cast him to crawl um, um, on mm -hmm. the surface, mm -hmm. but at that moment then, 
you wondered, okay, from that moment, Satan said, okay, let me see what else I can do to deter what he just did. Was he a witness to see what God just did and then put on his game or say, okay, game on now. He up the ante. Yeah. That is why in the wilderness after Christ's baptism, he still tried. Because even though he saw what happened in, in Eden and he saw the perfect covering of God's love, he upped the ante because he's still trying. Yeah. He's still trying. And so um, the love that steps in and the love that finds a way is the promise that God's promised us that he's going to send the Redeemer so we don't have to live that life of sin anymore for God so what? Love the world that he does what? That he gave his only, that whosoever again, free choice, even though he gave his son is a free choice who want to accept him. That whosoever believe it in him should not perish. You see the free choice? Whosoever. He gave him for all but he didn't force all. He said, whosoever. All right, we're running on to Thursday. Our high priest, five minutes. So we know our high priest is Jesus Christ. And we know what our high priest, or we should know what our high priest is doing for us today. It says what Jesus did for us on the cross enables him to intercede for us in heaven. Our resurrected Lord is our great high priest, providing everything we need to be saved and to live in God's kingdom forever. So what is he doing for us now? He's interceding. Remember what, you remember when they were in the wilderness and had that high priest and the, the role and the work of the high priest. So Christ is in heaven taking on that role as the high priest. For we do not have an high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet what? Yet without sin. Let us then be confident, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So again, Christ knows the challenges that we face and the struggle. And so that is why he is able to intercede for us. Because even when we go to the mercy throne of God, it is because of Jesus. It is not because of us. It is because of the blood that was spilled on our behalf. So he sees us through what? Through the eyes of his son. So when Christ died and that veil was torn, that gives us opportunity to come to the Father. It is only through Jesus Christ. You know, before you close, um, you said something, and um, I'm thinking about it. I was just thinking about it, um, that even in heaven, there was free choice. Mm -hmm. and then, then you got um, Adam and Eve still give them the choice. Mm -hmm. And that's the love for, um, of God, the free choice. He, that's his um, method. method of mm -hmm. free choice. But um, if we bring it here now on earth in this present moment, a lot of things that's going on, it's um, people trying to remove free choice. Yes. People trying, thinking, oh, okay, I'm trying to do the will of God, so let me remove the free choice from you and give you what I think is best for you. That and is, they're not representing And they're not presenting God. Yeah, they're thinking, okay, because <laughs> God could have just said, okay, let me remove all sins mm -hmm. and make everybody as one the way I want you. So whose work is that? That's the work of the enemy. Exactly. Because I think it was this week I was talking to somebody our last Sabbath while I was here and I, and I said, oh, Andrea, she, we were talking and she was saying that, you know, her heart was like really hurting that people were leaving, not wanting to go canvassing. And I said to her, don't let your heart hurt you. God give everybody the free choice. He doesn't force anybody to come. He said, follow me, but the choice is yours whether you wanna follow, yes or no. 
And so when people think, but we, we, we read, I think it's in Daniel, that what? When it, they think to change time, they think to change law, they, they, they think to stand in the place of God, to take away free choice from humanity, when they themselves are given free choices. So that's the work our, of the enemy. Yeah, our work as believers, um, and that's one thing you, we should tell everyone who believes in God, you give them the love of God and make them to choose, but mm -hmm. not to force them. Not to, to okay, force them. This is the way you need to go. This is the way. Don't do that. Just give, I give you the choice. I give you love, and I give you uh, what's wrong. So you pick. Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 28 and 27, quickly. When Moses was giving these departed instruction to the children of Israel, I have a minute, to, to the children of Israel, he told them because God showed Moses that when they enter Canaan, they're going to rebel, they're going to turn away. But, but, but what did Moses say? Moses said, I, um, you have the free choice of the blessing or the curse. And but he said, oh, I, and of life and death. And then he said, he said, oh, I wish you would choose life. But he never forced them. He said, I wish because the choice was theirs. It's still, the choice is still ours today. Whether we want to take that rebellious path that the enemy take or we want to take the path that lead to eternal life. And so... John, let, let me just close with John 17, 24. We know this is one of the greatest prayers. It says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So Christ was praying for us so that we would understand his work and the reason why he came. But Hebrew 1 says, and again, when he bring the firstborn into the world, he said, let all God's angels worship him. We know that the only person who deserves worship is Christ. We know that we're still living in the time of the great controversy. But we know, as I said earlier, we read the book. We know how the story ends. We have a choice. Today, I want to say to you, like Joshua, if Baal is God follow him. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for today. We give you thanks for these reminders, these lesson after lesson. And I pray, Father, that they will do something in us and for us. Live out your life within us, O oh Jesus, King of kings. Be with us for the remaining portion of the Sabbath day. And thank you, Lord, for sending your spirit to be in this place. Continue to dwell in us, Lord God. And at the end of it all, may we continue to walk the path that you laid for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Five minutes.
Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I was still talking. Good morning, church. Good morning. All right, good morning, saints of God. Amen. We're glad to be uh, here in the house of the Lord once again on this beautiful Sabbath day. It's um, cloudy, but uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. And we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. I want to welcome everyone here in, the, um, in person and those online who are watching uh, this day, uh, pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us, lead us, and guide us as we give praise and honor to our Lord and Savior. Um, as we, as I turn your attention to your bulletin, just want to point out a few things here. We are in the month of April. <clears throat> it's the first Sabbath of April, so just kind of uh, run down. We have this week, uh, Anita Smart was on the third. Uh, Kate, yesterday, Kate Sandvilles and Ronell Sear. And then tomorrow, today, uh, the birthday for Alan Rexwell, Rexroad and Lenani Neely. And uh, tomorrow, we have birthday for Sister Coretta Perkins. And then later in the month, we have uh, on the 21st, James Neely and the 29th is Aiden Banks. And uh, also, tomorrow is the anniversary for Alan and Rita Rexroth. So just remember them um, this weekend, today and tomorrow. Just a reminder, if those, anyone who has not yet received a Sabbath School Quarterly, uh, the actual book, they are on the shelf outside in the foyer. For that, next week, we'll be having potluck. Uh, it's our general potluck. So bring your, I'm sorry? Okay, Elder T Leslie is announcing that the potluck for next week will be fruit, vegetables, soup and bread. Okay, and then also next week, um, Elder Oswald Becca will be hosting or doing the uh, literature distribution after potluck next week. Now, this coming week, on the 10th, from the 10th through the 20th, the Texas Conference is sponsoring a um, 10 days of prayer. Special devotional speaker James Jensen, and the theme is God's Relentless Pursuit. I have the link. Uh, you go to the you can go to the, um, the website for the Zoom link for more information on that from the 10th through the 20th. You can see Sister Evine McDonald for the Family Day program that she's preparing for May the 18th, and also as we are coming into well we're still in April, but the uh, summer camp. I have the each week for each age group um, for June, for the month of June. So anyone interested or needing more information on that, please Sister, Sister Jennifer Herman or Elder Tanny Leslie for that. And please remember our weekly meetings, Wednesday night prayer meeting and a Friday night prayer meeting. And for our board meetings, we'll have a, be having a board meeting on Wednesday. Tuesday, excuse me. Thank you. Those are the announcements. Well, good morning, everyone here and yonder on the uh, internet. Uh, happy Sabbath and happy day before Eclipse Day. Hopefully, we'll be able to view one of God's rarest wonders through glasses, of course. And uh, we'll be doing starting our worship with Psalms 119, uh, reading verses 33 to 40. I'll uh, we'll do the <clears throat> odd, odd verses, and the congregation will respond to the even verses. That's Psalm 119, starting at verse 33. <clears throat> 
in Psalm 119, 33, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it to, unto the end. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. Turn away my reproach which I fear, for thy judgments are good. In a prayer for this morning, as we start our worship, Father, we ask that you pour your spirit upon us as we worship today. Give us wisdom in abundance, not only for our own sake, but also that we may be in your service to others. Also understanding that we may ever walk in your good and perfect will. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. All right. Uh, on, our on our first song for this lovely Sabbath is titled, uh, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High, an old classic. Uh, so if, uh, please, um, <laughs> stand, please stand. Um, so the words will be on the screen. And just enjoy.
Thank you. You may be seated. church Good okay uh, some of us we have different talents different ministries mine I found out I just found out that instead of coming to church and just sitting I'd love to do something for Christ uh, we realize the things that are happening in this world it cannot be long now or else he owes us an apology and so I need to get moving I need to start running and telling others about Christ in my way of life and what have you. This morning, uh, my poem is entitled, If I Got Jesus. It is really a song, but not all of us can sing. And COVID took my voice away some four years ago, my singing voice. And I promised the Lord, if he just, if he took my voice, I would be okay. This morning, if I got Jesus. I've had a dollar to my name. I've had friends that walked away. And I've even lost myself a time or two. There have been bridges crossed and burned. But through all the wreckage, I have learned that there is one thing that I can never lose. If I got Jesus, I got all that I could ever need. Take the world away from me and I'll be okay. If I got Jesus, there's a hope that's living deep inside, a joy that I can never hide and a safe place to fall. If I got Jesus, I got it all. There have been weakness turned to strength Sorry. There have been weakness turned to strength. I'm sorry. Yeah. I've seen weakness, sorry, turn to strength. And I've seen courage met with grace. And it's not for what I've done, it's a Christ in me. It's a miracle I cannot explain but he's given me his name. I'm the happiest woman that I can ever be. If I have Jesus, I have all that I would ever need. Take the world away from me and I'll be okay. If I have Jesus, there's a hope that's living deep inside, a joy that I can never hide, and a safe place to fall. If I have Jesus, I have it all. One day, the trumpet is going to sound, and the King of Kings will rise up from the clouds coming down. I'll hit my knees, O oh Lord, that sings my soul. I'm going home. If I have Jesus, I have all that I would ever need. Take the world away from me, and I'll be okay. If I have Jesus, I have it all. As we leave here today after the sermon, let us remember Christ. If, let us remember church that if we have Jesus, we have it all. It might not be in this world, but in the world to come. Thank you. But brethren, it's now time for prayer. Is there any prayer requests?
up in heaven, our creator and Lord. This morning, oh God, we, your humble servants, come before your presence. Just want to give you thanks and praise, oh God, first of all, for sparing our lives to bring us into your presence to worship you today. I want to give you thanks, oh God, to have kept us throughout the week, to have provided the necessities that we need throughout this week, for your journey in mercies on the road from work and to, to home. I want to give you thanks. I want to give you thanks, Lord, because we have the opportunity each and every day to come boldly at your throne. But as we gather here as church family, Lord, we come with various situations, various problems. Some of us hearts are burdened. Some of us are sad. Some are in pain. But we come, Lord, because you said we should come as we are. You said burdens are lifted at your feet. So we come before your presence, just want to praise your name. We pray, Lord, that you may empty us of everything that is unlike you. And as we lay our burdens at your feet, help us, Lord, not to pick it up, but to leave it as it is, leave it at your care, because you alone has the solution. You alone has all our future in your hands. And so, Lord, you heard the numerous requests. These are requests that's been going on over and over. And we, we need to see you working in our lives, oh God. Your continuous working in our lives because you have been working. Teresa continued to lift up her family before you. Her dad, her son-in-law, her granddaughter, her son, her entire family, Lord. She continued to lay at your feet. I ask, oh God, that you may grant her the desire of her heart. You see her heart as she yearned for her family, oh Lord. And we know that you love us with an everlasting love. So I pray, Lord, that you may let, let your will be done in her family, where healing is necessary, oh God, where whatever she stand in need of, I pray, Lord, that you may grant it unto her and her family, and that you may give her a praise on her lips. We continue, Lord, to lift up Cassie and Nyla before you. They are your child. You know where they are. We pray for DJ, Lord, as she continue to pray for them. And Eva Hans, I pray, Lord, that you may be with the family. I pray that you may continue to speak into Cassie's heart and even Nyla, that they may come back to you, Lord, and that you may direct their lives as you are doing and as your plan is for all of us, is that one day we all will be with you. And so, Lord, I pray that you may visit her at this time. Visit both of them. Visit the family, DJ's family at this time. And I pray, Lord, that you may continue to bless them. Remember Sylvia and Sylvia's sister who, and her niece. The sister is going to go to the doctor to check on, get some checks done, Lord. I pray for a good result. I pray for healing. I pray for restoration. I pray, Lord, that you may continue to help us to stand, Lord, in spite of our situation. You promise us that the road is not going to be easy. And through our suffering, sometimes you allow us to go through sufferings, you allow us to go through sickness, but you promise that you'll be there. So I pray that in Sylvia's family, you may give them hope that you are still with them and that you will take them through. Continue to remember Rhonda and her family. You said weeping will endure for an eye, but that joy will come in the morning. We know, dear God, that death one day will be destroyed. We know, Lord, that sickness and suffering one day will be destroyed. And so, Lord, keep Rhonda's heart and her family focused on you. Give them strength, give them comfort, give them reassurance, and give them hope, Lord, for a new home with you in heaven. And so for the silent requests, you know, our hearts, you know, our intention, you know what we stand, all of us stand in need of. Visit every home every heart that is represented here, and even those who are online, every visitor that walks through this place, oh God, and those that are present here, every member, I pray for them this morning, Lord, that you may give us the strength to hold on and not to let go and not to give up because we know that your coming is near. Be with the speaker this morning as she presents your word. I pray that, Lord, that you may give her the strength and give her the power to proclaim your word. 
help us, Lord, to absorb it and help us to put it into practice. Bless each and every one of us as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, our next so song is In His Time. Uh, please ask the congregation to stand. Please stand.
Our next song that we'll be singing is I Surrender All in a cappella. So please remain standing. time for the scripture reading. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 32. 
If you could turn to that with me. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. All right, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just as devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, they took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Amen. Amen. And our final song before we go to the lesson of the day is Speak, O Lord.
Happy Sabbath, church. I love that song. And every time I request that song, DJ said, you're not tired. And I said, you don't even understand when you going up to speak to God people, what that song, we could have just sing that song and go home. Because when I think about that song and the message that was given to me, the, the song alone says it all. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep with us to shape and fashion us in your likeness. Teach us full obedience. Speak, O oh Lord, and renew our mind and help us grasp the height of your plans for us. Today, I want to talk to us on the topic, living and walking or living and moving by the Holy Spirit. I pray that you all are having a blessed day. In spite of what the week, in spite of what we have, the week we might have, I know for some of us, it's not the best of week where allergies is concerned. There are a couple of days that I just literally had to stay in bed because of the headache. Didn't even know if I would be able to make it here today because of that misery, facial ache that I have. But despite it all, God has been faithful. Amen. And today, he's showing up again in this place. Let us pray. Eternal God and our Heavenly Father, speak, O Lord. Not I be seen, but Christ in every word. Hide me behind the cross, but not from your presence. I avail myself a feeble lump of clay to be used by you. May the word which go from my lips will go and pierce the heart of everyone who hear it. May they take whatever bits and pieces belong to them. And in the end, while you speak, I pray that your church will be filled with your glory. Mold and fashion us, Lord, in your likeness and help us to hear your truth and your truth only. In Jesus' name, let the church say. Amen. And so today, thank you, Emily, for the scripture reading. We're going to look at Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 32. But before we get to 25, let us just, let us just begin at Luke chapter 2 so we can have a backdrop of what brought us here. So in Luke chapter 2, it talks about the birth of Christ. And we know that when Caesar Augustus gave the decree that, you know, that all the world should be taxed and uh, Joseph and Mary, and they went back to their hometown to um, pay their taxes and stuff. We know the story of the angel visiting the shepherd and we know about the baby Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And there comes after the 40 days, if you should go back in the Old Testament in Leviticus, where we were given the law of purification, you know that after
after a woman gives birth, then she has to go through her time of purification to get her body back so that 40 days of purification was over and now it was time to present this baby, Jesus, back to his father. And so when we reach to verse 25, so verse 21 says, On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he, before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it, as it was written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with that is said that the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle dove or two young pigeons. Now, this was not the, the, the main sacrifice or, or offering that would present it. The pair of turtle doves or the two young pigeons was for those who was less fortunate. So when Mary and Joseph came into the temple, bringing in the savior of this world, we can recognize that they were poor because they brought the offering that was reserved for the less fortunate. And it says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. I want you to take note of that. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. He moved by the Holy Spirit and went into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now let your servant depart in peace. For mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentile and the glory of your people Israel. I want you to know that when Luke wrote this, Luke was not written, Luke was not writing to the Jewish audience. He was writing to the Gentile believers. But he used the life and example of this Jewish man called Simeon. And so he let his readers understand that Simeon lived a life directed by the Holy Spirit. Not only was his life directed by the Holy Spirit, he was obedient to the Holy Spirit. And so I want to spend these few minutes examining the life and character of Simeon and see how it is that the Lord was able to work in his life and how he can and will work in our life if we subject to him like Simeon. You see, the scripture pulls four main characteristics. One, it says that he was righteous. Some translations say he was just. He was righteous and devout. What does that look like? To be righteous and devout is when someone has totally committed to a cause or belief. So we can safely say that Simeon was committed in his relationship with Christ. He was not straddling the fence. He did not believe in the gray area. As a matter of fact, he did not play the game on the, in the river and the bank. He was righteous 
and he lived by God's principle. He did what was morally, ethically, and spiritually right. He was not saying, do as I say, and not as I do. He was not like the Pharisees that Jesus says, your outside look good, but on your inside is dead man bone. So he was righteous. So that's characteristic number one. Number two, he was waiting on the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. We know from scripture that before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would have manifested in the lives of some prophets and some king. We remember when Saul was anointed, it says that the Holy Spirit was on him and he began to prophesy. But not everyone had the Holy Spirit, and it wasn't poured out in such measure as it was on the day of Pentecost. But here was Simeon, an old man. We don't know how old he was, but we know like the rest of Israel, he was waiting on the deliverer who would come to take them from the oppression of Rome. So while he was waiting, because the Holy Spirit was rested on him, we know that he had peace. We know also that peace is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And so Simeon was waiting on the consolation. He was waiting on the comfort, the comforter to come, to deliver Israel. And he waited patiently because the Holy Spirit was on him. Acts 1 verse 18 tells us that when the Holy Spirit is on you, you will be a witness and you will see that Simeon became both a witness in witnessing the Savior and also witness what Christ would do not only for the Jew but for the Gentile believers. Three, the Holy Spirit spoke to him. He made him a promise. He told Simeon, you will not die until you have seen the Lord's salvation. Now for a promise like that to be made, it tells you that God has to come through with his word. And so Simeon waited on the promise through faith. Because like everyone else, he was waiting. But now he was waiting with faith because it was promised that he would not taste death until he had seen what he was waiting on. You see, Simeon knew that this was God who was speaking to him through the power of the Holy Spirit because he was able to understand the voice of God. Many times, Christ wants to speak to you and I. The Spirit is trying to get our attention, but we are too busy talking and not listening. And we are told that in times we have to learn to quiet our own voices. So now Simeon was told that what he was waiting or who he was waiting for was indeed coming because his eyes would see the promise. Some of us. If we are told to wait on something and it seems as if it is taking too long, we lose faith. We lose hope. Why? Because we are living in a microwave time. Everything needs to be ready now, fast, but not Simeon. He knew that he who had promised is faithful. And so he had no problem waiting as old as he is. He knew that he could trust God's word. And so by waiting, 
he was standing firm on the promises of God. The songwriter says, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Simeon was standing on the promises of Christ his Savior. And so he held on to the promise as long as it took. Characteristics number four, he moved by the Spirit and he went into the temple. In order to move by the Spirit, we have to be obedient when the Spirit bids us to move. And so, because he was obedient to the Spirit, he was at the right place at the right time. Simeon proved to us that it is possible to live a life that is fully devoted to God. So this is Simeon's story, you might say. So what does it have to do with you and I? So this was written for us so that we can learn from it. The scripture, he is, he is named Simeon and his name means one who hears or listen. Your name or my name might not be Simeon, but it doesn't mean that we are not called to the same level as of obedience to the Holy Spirit as Simeon was. God wants us to live a life totally surrendered and committed to him and directed by him through the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit takes control of our life, we will be able to discern things that ordinary people cannot discern. The scripture tells us that spiritually things are spiritually discerned. In order for Simeon to develop such a lifestyle, it didn't come overnight. It takes great commitment prior the reading of God's word, worship, to have such relationship with God. You and I can have such relationship, but we have to be committed. We have to be intentional with our walk with God. So are we living and moving by the Holy Spirit. When Simeon went into the temple, I want us to understand that when he saw Mary and Joseph with this baby, there was nothing fascinating that could pull his attention. They didn't wear royal clothes. They were poor. I told you that they bring the offering that was set out for the less fortunate. But because the Holy Spirit was guiding his life, he was able to discern that this is the lamb that come to take away the sin of the world, as poor as they were. He was able to understand that this baby was the Lord's salvation that was promised to him that he would see. Why? Because he was listening to the Holy Spirit. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to him, but it was the power of Christ. He had an encounter with Jesus as a babe. There were other people in the temple that did not recognize. They too, like Simeon, was waiting for the consolation of Israel. They too wanted to be freed from the Roman oppression. 
But here is the Messiah that they were waiting on in their midst and they did not recognize it. It's easy for us to sit in church and don't recognize Christ. Where was the 10 virgin? Weren't they in church? How many recognized Christ? So let us not fool ourselves thinking that because we are here, because we are Seventh-day Adventists, because we are Christian or call ourselves Christian, that it is okay to just sit comfortable and live comfortable anyway. We are given the example of Simeon, a man like you and I, he was not an angelic being. He was a mere man like you and I, living in the time of oppression like you and I. But he set himself apart so that the Holy Spirit could rest upon him, so that he could hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, and he could move when the Spirit says move. I pray that you and I will not miss the opportunity when Christ is in our midst like the others who were in the temple. Simeon had a spiritual relationship that was cultivated. You and I are given that same opportunity to cultivate a relationship with Christ. And don't say it was because he had the Holy Spirit. The scripture tells us that God is more willing to give us the Holy Spirit than we are more willing to ask for it. In Joel chapter 2, God made a promise that in the last day he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. It doesn't mean everybody. It means those who are his. Those that are willing to listen, to live, and to carry out his plan. But before he made that promise, the children of Israel had brought to a place of repentance. God wants to pour his spirit on us today. But we have to be willing to receive it and be willing to do the work. As Acts 1, 18 says, when the spirit is on you, you will be my witness. There's a work for us to do. And Christ is willing to use us as co-laborers with him. But we have to be willing to walk, move, and live by him. See, Simeon was waiting on the consolation of Israel. He was looking for Jesus to come, that promised lamb. You and I are looking for the second return of Christ. That is our consolation that we are waiting on. But if we do not develop a life of living and moving by the Spirit, we may very well miss him when he come in the clouds. You see, church is not a ticket to heaven. Sabbath keeping is not a ticket to heaven. But it is by accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and living the life that Christ calls us to live is our ticket to heaven because there's no other name under heaven where we buy saved but by through the name of Jesus. So you and I have to be intentional in fostering that relationship with Christ like Simeon did. Ephesians 4 verse 30 tells us that we should not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom we are sealed for the day of redemption. When the Spirit speaks, we need to listen. And when he say move, we need to move. And when the Spirit is on us like Simeon, we will be able to discern stuff and we will be able to make known to people that this is Christ. Amen. 
So let us, let us live righteous and devout so that the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit can become a reality in our lives. Let our daily prayer be Spirit of God descend upon my heart. Wean it from earth through all its pulses move. Stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art, and make me love thee as I ought to love. Then, when we would have prayed that prayer, let us say, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. You and I cannot have the Spirit of God and live our own way and comfortable just sitting down and getting by. When the Spirit of God is within us, we will proclaim Jesus to the world and to the people who still walk in darkness. Remember what Simeon said. He said that he is a light for the revelation of the Gentile and the glory of your people Israel. We are given the opportunity to be a witness for Christ. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us today. Can we live righteous and devote like Simeon? Yes, we can. It takes full obedience. It takes commitment. Can we hear the Spirit of God talking to us? Yes, we can. We have to avail ourselves, though. Can we move by the Holy Spirit? Yes, we can. We have to be obedient. How is our faith in waiting? Can we trust God's word to believe that even though it might seem long, that he's still coming? Simeon trusted that the deliverer would come. Are we trusting that Christ will return just as he has promised? Simeon's life is a testimony to all believers. He testified in his life that we can live like he lived. We can have the assurance of God in our lives because Jesus never fails. He testified that when we allow the spirit to move us, we will find ourselves at the right place at the right time. He testified to us that if we live a life that is led by Christ, our work would be different from those who do not understand or receive the power of Christ. His life testify that God is able to fulfill all the promises that he made to you and I. His life testify that the same love that Jesus had, then he had it for, he still have it for us today because he's sending his son to come again, this time not as a babe, 
but as the King of King and the Lord of Lord. But he's asking us to be obedient, to live and walk and move by the Spirit, to live a life that is righteous. Romans 5 verse 5 tells us that hope do not disappoint and we have this hope. We have this hope that burn within us. We too are waiting like Simeon. God didn't give us a time he didn't, he didn't give Simeon a time either. But Simeon know that he can take the word of Jesus with full assurance. You and I need to know that we can take the word of Jesus with full assurance. My friends, today, Christ has spoken He's saying to you and I that you don't have to live in Jerusalem to be righteous and devout. He knows that you and I are waiting and he's willing to pour his Holy Spirit upon us. He knows that you and I, if we live by faith, will see the Lord when he comes to claim us from this earth. The only thing is that Simeon was waiting for him as a babe. You and I are waiting for him to come as King Jesus. The message is clear that it is possible that if we surrender all to Jesus, and let him lead us, then we, like Simeon, will see the promise. And if we should take our last breath before it, he comes, Simeon said, no, Lord, you can let your servant die in peace because we know in whom we have believed. If death should knock at our door, we can go in peace because we know that the dead in Christ shall rise again. And so my friend, it is possible. It is possible to live that life like Simeon. There was nothing splendid about Christ, but Simeon, new Christ. You and I need to live and wait in faith. And when the Spirit bids us move, let us move. Trusting in the promise of God as we wait on his second coming. Scripture says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. If we are following Christ, then we can't follow the world. And if we are following Christ, then we have to be willing to listen to the voice of Christ. If we are following Christ, then we would have to obey Christ when he bids us move. If we are following Christ, then we would know that he does not force, but he loves and he speaks with authority. Maranatha, Jesus is coming again. You and I cannot afford to miss the encounter. You and I need to be like Simeon. Sandipati says, we shall behold him face 
face to face as our Savior and Lord. If that is your hope, and if that is your desire, that you shall behold him face to face, I ask that you surrender your life and say, speak, O Lord, so that when he speaks, you can hear. If it even means that you have to learn to silence your own voice and silence everything that is going on around you. Today, Christ is reminding us that the power, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit is yours to receive, it's mine to receive. But don't just think that he will pour his spirit on us for us to just sit and do nothing. When the spirit is poured on you, you will be my witnesses. The harvest is truly ripe. The laborers are few. But if you commit yourself to Christ, and to live and move by the power of the Holy Spirit, great works he can do with you, great works he can do with me. So let us trust Christ, because we have the blessed hope. Let us trust Christ, because the things that he gave us in his word is not impossible. If Simeon can do it, you and I too, because we have the same father. And he said that he is willing to give us the Holy Spirit more than we are willing to ask for it. Right. And our final song before we close uh, close services for today is "Sweet Sweet Spirit." Uh, may the uh, may the congregation please stand.
let us pray. Sweet Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word and a reminder that we can live like Simeon if we surrender to you, if we intentionally cultivate that relationship with you that Simeon had. Father, we know that we are waiting for the soon return of your son. I pray, Father, that we will take the example of Simeon and wait with patient faith and hope. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us today. Mold us, melt us. Give us your peace. Radiate within our heart, O oh God. And may we purpose today in our heart that we will live a life that is led by you. We will live a life where we will hush every other voice so that we can listen to your voice. That we will live a life that others looking on will know that indeed we live with our Savior. Help us to be citizens of heaven while we are here on earth. And Father, just as your Son came to be a light to the Gentile, may we point men and women who walk in darkness to you, the light of the world. Hear our prayers today, Lord, and I pray the ironic blessing upon our people. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Let the church say, Amen. Amen.